Hello, good afternoon, and welcome. I'm Guangming Wang, a software engineer on the formatting team. Today, I have the pleasure to introduce Paul Bunyub, one of our distinguished Zen masters. Paul runs a Tableau Center of Excellence at UBS, based in London. His team provides global Tableau server service to the whole organization, across IT and the business. They have built the service from a standing start to now having 10,000 active users. Hey. <laughs> Paul is an enthusiastic member of the Tableau community. He is very passionate about helping others achieve success with their own Tableau setups. He has been the co-leader of the London Tableau user group, and he blogs regularly on vizninja.com. A keen scuba diver, Paul is never happier than when surrounded by sharks. He has dived with 14 different species at last count. If you can get him a dive at the Mandalay Bay shark tank, please come and see us afterwards. <laughs> Today, Paul is going to share with us what he thinks makes a great user-focused and enterprise-level Tableau service. Please join me in welcoming Paul Benub. Hi, everybody. Thanks very much for coming. I really appreciate it. I know you've got tons of uh, sessions you could be at at this moment in time. Now, I will admit I've got a few healthy nerves about doing this in front of such, such a big crowd. Uh, recently, a few minutes ago, I received some sage advice from my eight-year-old daughter, Caitlin, who told me that all I need, she said, Daddy, all you need to do is just imagine everybody sat on the toilet. So that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> so if I look at you strangely at any point during the, during the session, that's exactly why. Um, yeah, so thanks very, very much for coming, and we'll get on with it. So UBS, founded in 1862. I think that's a picture of one of our early offices. We're headquartered out of the beautiful country of Switzerland. 60,000 employees across multiple regions. It's a truly global company. And as investment banking tends to be, we're pretty profitable. I think the net income was something like three and a quarter billion Swiss francs last year. But the average salary is only $7,400. Oh, that's 1939. That's the first data quality issue of this, this talk. Although my salary hasn't increased a whole lot more than that. That's the UBS bump. You can read that at your leisure. <laughs> um, so yeah, I run a Tableau Center of Excellence. Um, for the last four years, I've been building the service. The, I do actually have a, a wider role, enterprise reporting role, but uh, that's what I've, I've concentrated on, um, building that service, and today I want to show you how we've done it. I also blog a bit and tweet a bit, generally about Tableau enterprise-related stuff, so check them out if you want to. In the next 35 minutes or so, so I'm going to take you on a tour of our service model and show you the pillars that make up a, what I think is a good enterprise service. I'll take a little dive into the what it takes to be one of my team and, and what, they're looking, what we're looking for when we, we go out to the market looking for people. Actually, where is my team? Are they even bothered to turn up? Jake? Right. All right, he's sacked. It's a vac I've got a vacancy, by the way. Um, I'll show you the infrastructure and, and what, we need to, what you need, Tableau infrastructure, to support the amount of users we've got. Um, we'll embrace our inner Sherlock Holmes with some introspection into Postgres server log and server uh, log files. I'll show you how we maintain a, a laser-sharp focus on user experience and, and keeping users happy, and the significance of that graphic will become apparent later on. And we'll have a little look at our community as well, if the Wi-Fi holds up, which it didn't a few minutes ago. Now, a couple of words of warning. The first one is this is a big subject, so there's a lot of stuff I've missed out. There's a lot of stuff I've glossed over. If you, want, if you think I've missed something out, you want to go into more detail, then grab me. We'll do something at the conference, or we can do a WebEx anytime you want. I do a lot of that. The second word of warning is this is an IT talk, so I hope you're all prepared. The opportunities for comedy are somewhat limited. Um, I'll do my best, but if you, want to be, if you want to laugh, then go and see Paul Chapman's talk later on because he's a funny guy, he's a funny guy. Right, so let's set the scene for Tableau at UBS just to give some scale to the discussion. So we started around about 2012 with 
um, a POC for Tableau. We had about 10 desktop licenses and we dished them out to IT in the business and tried to gauge some interest. We said, hey, pick some selected individuals and said, off you go, tell me what you think. And then 10 licenses became 50, became 100. And that's when we started thinking, hang on, we might be onto something here, because 100 licenses is actually more than a lot of people's production deployments. And this was POC. And that gave us a lot of impetus to get funding. And when we got the funding, then there was obviously people waiting in the wings, and the license orders flooded in. And we rapidly went past 500, 700. And we've carried on. And at present day, we've controlled the progress quite, quite nicely. We were on about 1,300 or so Tableau desktop licenses across the firm. So. That's Tableau Desktop. On the server side of things, we, had, we just got a very basic server to start off with. And as you can see, similar pattern to the desktop usage. Within a few, few months, we're on 250, 500 users um, and continuing to grow. Now, one of the interesting things about that growth pattern is we, we I'll come on to introspection later, looking at log files and, and uh, the Postgres database. And we've been doing a lot of that right at the start. And it's a damn good job we were because at that point there, we were already, say, three quarters of the way through a purchase process to upgrade from eight cores to 16 cores, a process that takes absolutely ages at UBS. And it's a good job we were there because that happened pretty soon after. And it, we thought our reporting was broken, but no, a, a team had released some content firm-wide and, and our stats went through the roof. And, and our server did a corresponding you know, bath at that point, And we thought, OK, but it's a good job. We went from up to 16 cores pretty soon after to respond to that. Um, and then 16 became 24, became 48, and we're now on about 10,500 active server users per month. Um, going back to the POC and something else that really indicated to us that we were onto something good was during that POC, we actually had people running production content off the proof of concept server, a server that was running under my desk, basically. So it was the only POC box that you couldn't actually turn off. But these people was, were happy, were so happy and getting so much value from the tool, they were happy to sign that risk off and say, we, we're going to run production content on this. Not a good situation for me. So that sets the scale for the discussion, um, only heading in one direction as well. Now, the first pillar I want to talk about in the service is passionate data people. And this is all about getting the right person. And it kind of sounds obvious about getting the right person. You know, everyone says you need the right people to succeed. But in, in Tableau world, it really is very important. And when I've got a, a Tableau vacancy, I'm not just looking for somebody who's got Tableau on their CV as part of a suite of BI tools. You know, I, I want somebody who's totally bought into the mission that, that we're bought into, which is we feel Tableau is the best tool available to see and understand your data. And we want people to be that passionate. So I'm looking for people who are certified or at least working towards a certification. The Tableau certification program is an excellent program, and it's a real barometer of quality on someone's resume. I'm looking for somebody who's doing Tableau public work. Are they interested enough in data to visualize their own data and actually post it on Tableau public? Do they write a blog or contribute to somebody else's blog or collaborate on a blog? Are they active on social media, Twitter? Are they sharing insights? Are they the sort of people who come to conferences and put themselves on stage to share their own stories? Or do they facilitate, host, or speak at a Tableau user group? So these, this is much more than just having Tableau on your CV. If you've got these, these six pillars, then you really are bought in. And then if you pass that, the, the, the nightmare isn't over, because we're using data-driven interviewing to actually delve into whether the person is the right fit. This is a, an interview dashboard we have. We have a set of questions. We assign a score. The top row is Tableau, is Tableau desktop question analysis. The bottom is the server results. So you, and then at the end of it, we spit out a sort of, they get the X factor treatment whether we should proceed to the next round. Now, this guy here was three Xs, pretty weak on both. It's pretty obvious we can demonstrate to management and show no, that's, that person wasn't, wasn't good enough. This person here, very strong on Tableau desktop, pretty weak on server. But we actually hired that person because we thought, well, that would be a very good person to put in front of users to do Tableau doctor sessions and help users with their problems. But then it's clear that we need to train them on the server. And that's cool. So and we have another candidate here who smashed, all, smashed both pillars. So that, that was a, an easy decision to hire. So this is a really, um, a really good way of comparing your people and demonstrating to management that you've got a proper data-driven approach to bringing, your, bringing quality into your team. Um, 
And, and it, takes the, it takes the emotion out of things. We had two candidates recently who were very, the team felt were very, very close in terms of how they'd come across at the interview, but the data told the story. One was much stronger on the questions than the other. And again, if you pass that, the nightmare still isn't up because we then, we then leverage Tableau Public to see if we've got the right fit. So we get people to pick from one of these data sources, one of these data sets on Tableau Public, and we tell them, go away, design a visualization, and present it back to us. Um, and then what we're looking for in that session is the ability to, good vis to design visits with good vis practice, um, to talk about their design methodology, to, res to, to respond when challenged on, the, on their visualizations. Um, and really, that helps us get an understanding of whether this person has actually got the kind of fit that, that we need. And so the last three slides that I've showed you really do help us get the right kind of person into the team. Once, you, once you've passed that lot, then I'm confident as a manager that this person's totally bought into what I'm bought into. So just moving on, filling in the pillars. So the next one is, is the infrastructure. Now my team has complete control of the Tableau infrastructure at UBS, from the configuration on the Windows server, right up, into, right up until to the way the server is configured and, and even the service gets marketed. So it's a very good position for us to be in. Um, just pause over the environment a little bit. This, this page will be familiar to many of you server admins. We've got, at the moment, this is our production cluster. We've got an eight core, uh, we've got, a, sorry, a six workers, each of which are eight core and 128 gigs of RAM. Background is isolated to the individual node as, as per best practice. We also have a DR cluster, disaster recovery, which is exactly the same, which we flip to if we need to in the event of losing the production cluster. Got a UAT cluster, which is exactly the same, and that's where my team uh, can test patches and configuration changes and such like. And then we have three other environments. We've got engineering, we've got beta, and we've got alpha. And this means that we are involved in all stages of the Tableau release process. Tableau release and alpha, we start testing it and feeding back the same with beta. Then we test functionality in, in engineering, and if we deem that we want to go forward, we go into UAT through to prod and DR. And we also have an admin box which has some of the various Tableau server utilities on there, like, like those three. Um, and the significance of this environment is I've talked about, we put such a fuss into getting the right kind of person. Well, if you're going to grill people about being hot on Tableau, then you need to give them a proper environment to, to express themselves in. So this is a real Tableau playground for my guys, and I encourage my team to just go ahead. If they want to test something, go test it. If they want to break it, go break it. They've got the environment to do it. There's no point bringing people in and then constraining them with a, with a poor environment that doesn't have flexibility. So that's what we run, and that's... that's just about okay for supporting the number of users that we talked about earlier. Now, in introspection. What I mean by introspection is the ability to look into the data that's available on your service. And we do a lot of that, and I'll, I've divided it up into two categories, the first being infrastructure, the second being user-focused introspection, which I'll talk about later. So this is the Tableau server Postgres DB. It's a very old picture, very old schema, I think, version 8. Um, and uh, many of you, I'm sure, are are actually diving into that and having a look and extracting data from it. But if you're not, then it's, it's something very that you should be doing. I won't explain how, but Mark Jackson or Russell Christopher's blogs will, um, will be able to help you. And I've got a few screenshots here that, that, will, that, can, that can give some examples. So we've created about well over 100 inf infrastructure introspection views. I'll just buzz over a few of them here. So this one, it allows my team to manage extracts and schedules, and we can see here that um, we can tell which schedules are overloaded. We can see the success rate of, of, various, of various schedules, and we can look at the performance of the background. So you can see the, the black bars are the failures, and you can see that the, the extract refreshes are all rammed in, but there's also some dead space as well towards the end of the day. So that's a task for my team to then go ahead and work with users to optimize their, um, optimize their extract refreshes. This one talks about the CPU. Um, this is a healthy picture. You can see that the CPU on the cluster is fluctuating, but nothing major. We've got a few spikes to 100%. That's fine. This has been a very useful visualization because when we've seen particular workers flatlining at 100%, then we've, we've been able to maybe spot that a worker's not performing and fix it before we get an, an outage. This is how we measure capacity. We've got our... Um, Unique users at the top. We've got our concurrent sessions um, in the middle, and then some stuff about the CPU and memory, disk space. On the bottom right, we have extracts on the server, and that allows us to manage the content on the server and work out who's using what. 
The red extracts are ones that aren't being used, and we can actually go to our teams and say, hey, why don't you delete that content? There's a lot more we could do in terms of automation in this area. A lot of this, the remedial action that we take is manual at the moment, but we're looking to explore automation more. Dashboards like this are very useful when somebody wants to use the service and they come to me and say, well, how can I trust that you're doing the right thing with your infrastructure? I'll get very blunt questions from users like that. And then if we say, well, this is the sort of introspection we have, it gives them a sense of confidence in the service. We also take information from things like the web server log files on the server. Um, you see the top chart there. The red line is the number of users. The blue bar is the response time. And you can instantly zoom in on a few problem areas there. With, the, with large blue bars, you can see that um, towards the right, there's, there's a lot of users, but the response time is very poor. But then in the middle, there's kind of poor response time with low amount of users. So that allows us to drill more into those time periods and see actually what was the server doing at that time and spot problems. This visualization is about VizQL and how, and how, it, how the primary distributes work across a cluster. So, each of, the, each of the columns is an hour, and each of the splits is each of the workers. Um, so this is a healthy cluster. You can see that the primary is doing its job. It's distributing work out to the, to the cluster in an even fashion. Um, and this was a really good viz that, we allowed, that allowed us to find an issue with a worker that wasn't processing enough work. It was process, processing a fraction of the amount of queries that the other, one, other ones were, and it allows us to dive onto that worker and remediate it before it, before it had a problem. So, just a handful of the visualizations that we create that look into the infrastructure. And really, you're only limited by your imagination on that. So user focus and support. Now, I spend my day in one of three different roles. The first role is a bartender. So what's the best feeling in the world? Now, I should be careful asking that in, in Las Vegas, because I might get a multitude of different answers. Um, one of the best feelings in the world is when you walk into a bar or a restaurant or whatever, and your favorite drink is sat there waiting on the bar for you to just walk in, pick up, and go. And that's exactly the feeling I want my users to have using my service. I don't want them to have to queue up outside the bar. I don't want them to have to like, be frisked by an overenthusiastic doorman. I don't want them to battle through a crowd and then, and then order shout to get their order heard. I want them to just come in and get that drink and go away. And, and so we try to create an environment that takes friction away from users as much as possible. The second role is mind reader. So I'm, users don't necessarily come to us with problems. They will quite happily suffer in silence and then complain to each other and not use Tableau. So I am looking at all of these use cases all the time, racking my brains thinking, are we doing enough for that team? For example, a team that uses a lot of maps. I'm thinking, do they know about Mapbox? Do they know about Tableau Mapping.bi? Do they know about the experts in the community that are great at maps? Are they leveraging all those, those expertise? And so I'll reach out to them, and, and I'll try and head that off and say, hey, look at all these resources. So I'm all constantly trying to anticipate what various users' use cases are, because they won't necessarily tell me. And the third one is. I channel my inner Alec Guinness, so Alec Guinness, and use Jedi mind tricks as many, of you, as many of you guys do, fighting the fight, trying to change culture, trying to get people to use interactive data viz over cross tabs and Excel and such like that, trying to influence teams that maybe aren't doing it the right way, that what I see and you and I see is the right way. So three roles that I would typically spend my time at. And I'll just put over a few slides that will give some examples of, of user focus. And, and it can be as simple as things like this, which is just welcoming our users to the service. Somebody joins our community. They get an email. Hey, here's the training resources. Thanks for joining. This is how you get support. Here's some stats. Off you go. Very, very simple. Most people will ignore that. But occasionally, you'll get a mail back from somebody saying, hey, that's cool. I didn't know that. And you're building that relationship straight off the bat. And that's, that's been really good to uncover use cases that we would never have otherwise uncovered. The same with Tableau, the vendor helping us. So UBS is a huge global company. People often download Tableau trials or Tableau products or take a training course from regions of the globe that I know, that, and I, they don't even know we've got a service. So every time Tableau account managers see in a, a UBS email address, they'll ping me, and they'll connect me with the user. and. You've, you've got that relationship going. And th there's a serious side to that as well, because I've actually seen it on a couple of occasions users almost buy their own server 
uh, twice. And because Tableau managed to head that off, we, we stopped them doing it. So because if somebody else spins up their own server, that's, that's ruined the whole thing for me. So it's very important that I'm aware of everybody at UBS that touches Tableau. We also have a community, which I'll touch on a bit in a, in a few minutes. Um, reaching out to users is important. Very basic things like little interview series and th that we do where we reach out to users and ask them a few questions, um, get responses back. And that's great for publicizing the service. Users like to send out the in interview links to, the, to their colleagues as well. And also being aware of diversity events in the, in the community at UBS and, and leveraging them and, and helping people out, all of, all of which get to build your relationships with your users. This is probably my favorite user-focused initiative. And that's Tableau Champions. Now, this is loosely based on the Zen Master program that Tableau have got. Um, and it's all about identifying the users that love Tableau more than anything. You know, the ones that you guys introduced to Tableau 2, and you see the light bulb go off on their head, and you think, hey, you're, you're totally hooked. So, we're looking for users that demonstrate level of enthusiasm as well as skills, but the right attitude to support our service and help us achieve what we want to achieve. Um, there's only four of them at the moment out of thousands of users because it's not a badge that we give away lightly. And what do they get? Well, all these people want all day, every day is more Tableau. They love it. So, we do, so that's what we give them. We give them much greater exposure to the tool, much greater profile across UBS, um, and they contribute to the development of the service. And it's actually built into their objectives with their managers as well, so it's not seen as if they're doing work for free. So that's what they get, and then what they give us is they basically act as an extension of my team. They might do makeovers, they might drive user groups, they might um, host, host, do blogs and all sorts of things, help users improve content and drive your Tableau mission across the bank. Um, so a very, very easy to do, very valuable initiative that, that is fantastic for engaging with your power users. And it's, it's, no, it's all user-generated content. For example, one of our champions went onto one of our admin dashboards, found the most, the most hit dashboard on the server. It was terrible. Worked with the users, did a makeover, presented it back to the owners and said, there you go. And that took a couple of weeks. No work for my team whatsoever. Transparency. So another thing about user focus all our metrics are front and center for users to spot. So we've got things like the extract refresh latency, the performance of the CPU, we've got the, our trouble tickets. So if we're not performing, if, we, if my team's not processing tickets, then users are going to spot this. If our CPU is flatlining, users are going to spot this. So this doesn't half keep you honest. Also, when we do have problems, this is a little snippet from one of my update blog posts. This week, we actually had three outages. Now, 99% of our users would not have even known we had an outage there because we got the service back up and running pretty damn quickly. But we're out there broadcasting it saying, hey, we had a problem and this is, this is what we did about it and this is what we're doing to stop it happening again. And this has really allowed us to build a reputation as a team that manages incidents really, really well. And we can also often turn bad situations into good situations because people will reach out and say, hey, I didn't know you had that problem. It looks to be network related. Have you talked to so-and-so in networks? We'll go, we'll go off and, and work with those people. So it's, so it's really allowed the team to build up a good reputation in terms of actually being able to manage incidents well. And don't get me wrong, it hurts like hell when I have to write messages like that saying we had loads of incidents. But you know, it's much better than brushing something under the carpet, which is what a lot of teams have tended to do. Still on user focus, the one thing that users don't have at UBS is time. So we are respectful of users' time. And that's the way we do that is we make sure that the support we have got is super efficient. Each user type of user query goes to the correct home. If something's busted, get a ticket into service now. It goes through the incident management procedure. If you just want to chat or you need some help, so if you just want, if you just want some help, they can wait a bit. Tableau Doctor, book a Tableau Doctor session with the team. Might have to wait a couple of days, no problem. If you just want to chat about data viz or a very quick question, go to our link group chat. So different types of question go to a different, go to the most appropriate home for that question. And what that does is it cuts down on the worst possible way of communicating problems, which is email. 
because it does users' heads in when they email. They don't know if it's being picked up. It's not tracked. So my team doesn't get emails off users because every question goes to an appropriate home. And that is, to the users, is us being respectful of their time because they don't have to go chasing things up all the time. And I'll just talk a little bit about introspection in a user capacity. Now, I don't know if this is going to work because I just saw my connection drop out of halfway through this, but let's try it. So this is a visualization on when the server is being used. Very easy to spot. Uh, the, the heat map's very cool, so if I need to take the service down in, for emergency maintenance, I can pick a time that, that's least impactful. If you look at the bubbles at the top right here, you see that this is content that's being used a lot. If I click one, then you, know, you get more of a drill down into how, it's being, how many times it's being looked at, when it's being looked at, and crucially, who's looking at it. I've, I've taken the names away for privacy reasons, but you can see that these people of different ranks are looking at this. I mean, if I just kill that filter and maybe pick a, an ED, which is quite a senior position, you can see that this ED is looking at all of this content at this time. And now, th now that's where my team then comes in, because that's an action for my team. Go and work with the owners, the authors of that content, and make sure that it's as absolutely tip-top as it can possibly be looking good, performing well. Because they might not even know they've got this super senior person looking at that. And if that dashboard is crap, then that directly affects the perception of Tableau as a whole to that, to that AD. So that's where my team would come in. And it's great to know that information. Just to use it, analysis. This one's about location. We can see our unique users across the top, and we can see where, where they're based. We can see which areas of the business are using Tableau, and we can see even to a geographical base, on a workbook basis, what the geographical split is. For example, this, this visualization here, this workbook, completely APAC. It's never been hit outside of APAC. This one's pretty much APAC. This one's pretty global. So you can start understanding the location patterns of where your Tableau usage is coming from. And if I say go to region, now, all of our regions are pretty equal in terms of Tableau usage, but if I saw APAC streaking out ahead by, by thousands, that's pretty important for me as a service manager because I don't have any staff in APAC. When they're awake, we're all asleep. So I might have to consider putting bodies on the ground if I see that, that bar streaking out there. This one's actually one of my favorite visualizations, and it'll probably come apparent. It doesn't look as good as it could because I've chopped the column for the names, but... Um, the names are down the side, and the dots are somebody logging onto the Tableau server. So if I scroll down, you can instantly start seeing people. This person here accessed the system once, never came back. Why is that? I don't know. Did it, did it not work? Did it not give them what they wanted? Was it a poor experience? What it means is I pick the phone up, and I work it out. Um, you can see that the people with lots of dots are much more engaged with the platform, so they are users that are are on the server all the time. So I can say, okay, show me frequent users. Show me frequent and regular users. And now I'm starting to build up a picture of people out of that 10,000 population that are massively engaged with Tableau. And then I can take that a level further and say, well, I only want to see MDs. And now there's a, now there's a view that's really important. I've got a bunch of MDs across the business and IT who are all massively engaged with Tableau. I need to be on first name terms with every single one of those, those people. So I pick the phone up and I'll make sure that their Tableau experience is as good as it can be. So again, we've got dozens of these kind of visualizations. That's just a couple. Go through. Okay. Education and training. Now, we put a huge amount of time into training and many of some of the people in the front row have contributed to the training syllabus that we've, that we've built. Thank you very much. Um, we've been running training for a, quite a while now. We do an eight module training syllabus that runs every two months. Those are the subjects. Um, we've trained over 3,000 people across hundreds of sessions. It's free to attend, it's instructor led, um, and it's not death by PowerPoint or death by Tableau. It's interactive. Uh, the trainer will say, is go, create something, post it up to a temporary project on the server, and we'll talk about it. You know, we'll, they actually do exercises. Because if you just do death by Tableau, then people will flip to their email or something, and they won't concentrate. And we get great feedback. It's been a really successful initiative. We also supp supplement that with a, an executive-level training module, which is for senior folks. Um, 
all that really is, is me going into an MD's office with my laptop and, and saying, and, and trying to follow a, a loose agenda. Most of the time, it never gets anywhere near that agenda before they drag me down some rabbit hole that I don't want to go down. Um, but if I just turned up in their office with a laptop and said, hey, what do you want to know about Tableau? Then I look really stupid. Uh, I need to go in with a plan. Um, and this has been really successful. It's allowed us to build up a, a level of professionalism. Our, the management perceived the team as taking tab uh, training seriously and that we're flexible enough to communicate to different audiences. Again, dead easy to implement. We've got doctor sessions. You go on our community page, you book a doctor session with using a, an events booking tool. We devote three half days a week to doctor sessions because when we first did doctor sessions, people were just requesting them ad hoc and that meant the team was chopping and changing all over the place and it was a real nightmare. But now we do Monday, Wednesday and Friday mornings for doctor sessions. Again, we've had hundreds of appointments. Very, very popular. Users absolutely love that one-to-one -one focused consultancy time. And we supplement it with two other things. We've got Tableau Doctor Digest, where our team writes up a, a, a bi-weekly blog post of all the interesting doctor sessions that they've had, maybe some interesting problems, post that out. We do Tableau Doctor Live, where Tableau will parachute in a product consultant to one of our offices. We'll lock them in a room somewhere with lots of coffee, and users will just drop in and drop out with laptops and, and, and have their doctor sessions there. Again, really cool. Users just love that focused time. And again, introspection. We, we track all our data in terms of training. We work out who's attending, who's not attending, what rank they are, what the, what the main keywords are that are coming up in doctor sessions. Can we pull out some trends out of that? So, and this is like the cherry on the icing. It's called Tableau in Focus. This is just a set of webinars that Tableau do for us. Tableau product consultant will do it. Um, we just gather the audience and they set the WebEx up. It's cool. And the last one we had, which was designing performant dashboards, I think we had over 350 people attend that one, which is fantastic. And again, no work whatsoever for my team. So Tableau is a really great tool in terms of self-learning. Self I'm a self-learner. My team is self-learner. You guys are all self-learners, I'm sure. Um, I expect everyone to be a self-learner. There's nothing that you need a Tableau training course for, to be quite honest, that you can't teach yourself. So my team puts a lot of effort into training, but we shouldn't have to. Everybody should be able to train themselves up to be good at Tableau with all of the learning resources that are out there, the videos and such like. And it's quite frustrating to me that people aren't self, a lot of people aren't self-learners. So, you know, to, if you're not a self-learner, you've been told. <laughs> it's me trying to be straight. Okay, social community. We've got a social community platform. It's based on Jive, which is a reasonably good tool for using, for, for creating an internal community. This is where I need to buzz out again. Definite disaster potential here. Just due to time, I'm not going to dwell on it too much. This is the, really the heartbeat of what we do, our, our community page. You can see at the top, easy to get your support or get training or book a doctor session. You can see that we've got a whole bunch of events, many of them our training sessions, but lots of other ones. There's the Tableau in Focus, there's Kribble's Zen Master thing, um, and other stuff. So if we see not only just our events, but if we see any events in the community, they're going up on there, and we encourage our users to use the external events and attend webinars as much as possible. Um, we've got loads of blogs. We, we, try and get, we try and update the post, the, the page, every day. A lot of these blogs are by users, which is great. People talking about that, there's one, someone's got a vacancy for, for a, a Tableau position, there's a project update, there's all sorts of different things going on. As I said, front and center are metrics on, the, on our connections page, our community page that people can see. We've got service updates, I'll just scroll down a bit more, you will see things like FAQs, and then you'll see a section called Tableau use cases, which is where users will blog about their own experiences with the tool, and we encourage that a lot, and I'll just touch on a couple of them here. So here's one from one of our, our best teams, which is a HR analytics team. They've done a blog, they've got some screenshots, they've talked about their design methodology, how they're using a story, color, interactivity, white space. Some more screenshots, they're really starting to show off and show what they've been doing with the tool. And then what you want is the collaboration factor at the bottom, where users are then starting to share ideas, compare visualizations, and say, hey, I like that, show me how to do it. It's exactly what our community is all about. 
This blog post here, this is a user that's created a dashboard. It's a pretty rudimentary dashboard, but the point is it took eight hours to, previously before Tableau, it took eight hours for them to create this Excel report, and eight hours a week, I think, and, and send it out, and nobody read it. And then from that, they've then got their dashboard on a big screen in the office, auto-refreshing on the server. So that, that user, is, I mean, it's, it's a crappy dashboard, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> So, can you edit that bit out, please? Um, but the point is, they've gone from A to Z. Tableau has taken them from A to Z with their reporting capabilities. So this community page, um, we're lucky that we've got Jive. I mean, some of you, I'm sure, are struggling with things like SharePoint to try and create a, a community on. But, uh, and we spun the community up on the P at the start of the POC because the thing with people often come to me and say, how, how, can you, how can I get a community going? And you can't just click your fingers and get a community going. It takes ages. So we spun that up at POC level like four years ago. And even now, out of 1,000 members of the community, there's probably less than two dozen that actually do anything on it, that actually contribute or write posts on it. It's very, very slow going. You just have to keep believing, keep doing the right thing, and people will eventually, you will eventually gain traction. But community, absolutely essential. Let me go back to PowerPoint if I can find it. And of course, introspection. We, we drill into the data behind connections. We work out where we are, where we're ranked. And you can see here that actually we're ranked 13th in the whole firm out of, I think, 3,000 communities there are. We're trying to catch up with annuity sales desk. They're really winding me up. I'm going to have to get them and get into the top dozen. Um, now, partner and vendor relationships. The, you've seen a lot of the partners and the other vendors around here, and, and, and here's, a, here's a few of our friends. And it's, what we try and do here is we try and support these people as much as possible, and that's not necessarily by giving them money, much as they would like it. Um, a lot of these people have got, they want feedback on, on products, they want people to be interviewed, they want betas to be tested, they just want, they just want you to see what they're doing. And we support them. We'll, we'll do all of that. We'll test the betas. We'll, we'll support these people because they will support you back when you least expect it. So understanding what everyone's doing in the, in the partner and vendor space is very important. And we, we try and help everybody as much as we possibly can. Now, Tableau community, you've, you'll hear a lot about this this week. And, and the reason I talk about this is because not just because I engage in it, but we, I try and get all of my users to engage in it as well because the value is just out of this world. Talking to people is what I do. I talk to people internally. So this is me in Zurich doing a, a, a local technology expo telling UBS users about the, the Tableau service. A very, very busy day. To give an idea of how busy I was that day, I had my breakfast at 7 o'clock in the evening on the airport on the way home. It was insane. Um, but talking to people, publicizing the service, and it was great because some of our users even showed up wearing Tableau t-shirts to say, hey, you're doing a great job. We love your service. So talk as much internally to people as you can. And then when you finish doing that, talk to people externally. This morning, I talked to a, a Japanese insurance company. That was interesting. None of them spoke English, actually. So it was, it was quite, a ch quite a challenge. But uh, I do a lot of these reference calls, and they're really valuable. And you can see over the last three years, I'm up to almost 200 different people that I've spoken to across different companies all about this kind of thing generally. And, it, and it's not me showing off, because I learn a lot of, as much from them as they learn about me. Everyone's got different ways of doing things, and I've taken a load of ideas back to UBS from talking to these people. The point is, I love talking to people. I've talked to them in loads of different countries, Australia, Greece, Switzerland, Sweden. I get a, about a whole load of different subjects. Training comes up quite a bit. So try and talk, try and build that network. And you'll see a bit about the Zen Masters and the Tableau Ambassadors. Try and leverage these people. These are people who really want to help you. They really want to help you build your service. Um, they've all got different levels of expertise, different areas of expertise, and they'll give up an evening or two hours of an evening to help you through a problem and encourage your users to do the same. Many of them have got blogs, a whole load of different subjects, different subject areas. Make sure that your internal users at your company are engaged with, what, with the resources out there in the blogosphere. Because if they are, then that often saves them needing to contact your team. And the same with events. There's conferences. There's um, 
talking of uh, presentation events, there's festivals, there's infographic events. Make sure that you and your users are more than aware of what's out there. So, to wrap up, this is our service. Um, you can see we've got, we've got a complex infrastructure that we manage. You can see that we're very focused on, on users and, and introspection, put a ton of time into training and community, as well as the, the partnerships with other people in the Tableau world. And it's all underpinned by the right kind of Tableau person. Just a few key takeaways. Obviously, get the right people, empower self-service. One thing I neglected to mention is that our service is completely self-serve. My team does not create content for anybody. We've got a team of three people servicing 10,000 users. If we were creating content for people, we'd totally be the bottleneck. So users do it all themselves, and we empower them to do it themselves. Dry, dive in, be nosy. If you've got data, track it, visualize it. Spend time on training and education. Build that community and also your networks. So, that is our service. That's how we built it. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Questions? So um, I think there's a mic going around, Kim. Yes, hi. Uh, great presentation. Um, would you be able to email us the deck uh, you know, at some point, or would you be able to give us your email so we could request the deck? Is yeah, if you want to add yourself to be one of the list of reference calls that I do, just ping me and we'll have a WebEx after this anytime Can you, you want. Can upload it to the site? Yeah, it'll be on the site and Tableau yeah, will distribute it. You'll probably be able to get it online. Yep. Mm -hmm. But if you want to dive into anything in more detail, happy to do that. Any more? Uh, fee? Okay. It's coming. Hey, Paul, great speech today. Really enjoyed your session. Two questions for you. Um, one, your server admin visas that you've got, are you able to share them in any way or perhaps some cut-down versions of what you've got? Yes, I've been meaning to do that for a while. I just haven't got around to it. There are things, Mark, Mark Jackson's got a few, but, yeah, I'm happy to, to share the ones in, in any way I can. I might have to obfuscate some stuff, though. That'd be great. And the uh, second question is, so you've got a lot of things, and I know that you've been uh, working on this for a, a long time, and you've got into it the great kind of uh, operating model. What are your future plans? Now, that's a good question. Uh, future plans is uh, obviously keep expanding the service, um, but also optimise a lot of the content that we've got. So we've got a lot of junk extracts out there that we just haven't managed to get rid of, and a lot of automation as well. I mean, a guy, I'm working a bit with Chris Toomey from Zillow Group, who's actually presenting at this very moment, actually, and he's a wizard of automation. So there's a lot of manual stuff that the team does that we just shouldn't have to do. Um, also, we, we're keeping plugged in with Tableau as well. We're at the forefront with them. Alphas, pre-alphas, there's not a single bit we're not plugged into, and, it, and we want to keep that relationship going with Tableau as well. Hey. So, um, which one? Hey, Paul. Hey. Can you talk about how you approach making over work um, that's substandard or maybe low performing and how you go about handling yeah, people's I mean, feelings? Yeah, I mentioned this. That I mentioned the service was self-serve, and that's great for agility. Users can bang straight in and out of production, but what it, what it ends up doing is means that a lot of the stuff on the server is not great because we haven't had a chance to sanitize it first. Now, I don't want to take that agility away from users, so we look at things like the, the admin views to work out. There was a view that I didn't show there, which was about performance and how content was performing. We can pull out users that are designing content that's slow as hell on a regular basis, and then my team will follow up with them. And that's actually been a really good thing because we've proactively gone after users. There was one example where we, went, we saw a user that was generating slow content. We went after them. We said, hey, we think you're not getting the best possible experience out of Tableau. And they were like, what? I love Tableau. I'm fine. I'm fine with my one-minute load time on my dashboard. And we said, we're not fine. We think we can, we can be a lot better. And they said, well, that's amazing. I've never had an IT team proactively come to me and say, we think you could be getting more out of our service. It's always me having to complain first. So, yeah, that's, that's how we do it. It is, it is manual at the moment, but it's great for user interaction. So, uh, sorry. How do you manage your 1,000 desktops and reallocation in the annual renewal process? And then for your server, do you charge? Do you have internal cross-charges? Or, is, or does your 
department fund it and the business uses it for free? Okay, I'll start with server. Yes, uh, uh, the server charge is free at the point of use for users at the moment. It comes out of a different charge bucket. We are looking at chargeback later on. We haven't quite decided what model to use. It's a difficult one because you get it wrong, you drive the wrong behavior from users, but yeah, we're gonna start shredding back to the business in terms of server usage. The first question about desktop licenses. Yeah, we, everybody's got their desktops locked down. You need admin to be able to install anything, which is great. So my team decides what release goes out and when it goes out. Um, and if we track all our licenses and if a user hasn't used a license in three months, we're having it back and we're gonna give it to somebody on a waiting list. We maintain a waiting list on our community page and we quite happily whip a license out from somebody that's not using it. And that's really important because you have to demonstrate that, you're, that the software you've bought is being used. You have to demonstrate that to management. And typically on every harvesting round, every three months, we'll pull back 10 to 20 licenses and give them to, some, give them to the needy. Um, we've got a third party software that distributes out the, the packages and we just use that. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Can you get the mic, please? Uh, this, I think this guy was, this gentleman was first, so if... Well, it just, it's, uh, it's tied to licenses, um, sorry. Uh, do you have rules as to who you issue the license to? Um, or anyone asks and you kind of just give it? And... Um, well, we, it's whoever's got their name on the waiting list, but um, absolutely, all our users are equal, but let me just say that some are more equal than others. Paul, my question is, how often do you upgrade ta Tableau version and how do you manage it? Do you do in-place upgrade or what is the methodology? Uh, yeah, it's, it's in-place upgrade. And really, um, upgrades are a very interesting one because in my, my opinion is if you don't have to upgrade, don't, because it, it, production stability comes first. Um, so we evaluate every release for compelling functionality and bug fixes. If it doesn't tick the boxes in then, we'll just say where we are. For example, we're on 10.0 at the moment chose not to go to 10.1 or 10.2 because we didn't think there was enough in that for us because it's a big effort packaging the desktop, distributing it, doing the server at the same time. It's a big upgrade effort. So we're going to go to 10.3. That's our next, our next release. So yeah, we, we evaluate each release for its merits. Um, at the moment, we're probably further behind the Tableau release cycle than we've been in a while. But um, yeah, if the team gets its act together, we'll have 10.3 pretty soon. Hi. A uh, very impressive uh, presentation. Thank you. If I heard you right, you, you said you have three people on your team that support this. Yeah. That, that's, a, that's even more impressive. Uh, any advice to somebody starting at square one? Um, it's possible. It's, be, believe it's possible to, to succeed. Don't expect instant gratification. Um, two of the most important things would be to set your service model out at the start. So we went self-serve. We said, you guys are creating content yourself. We want to empower you to do it. We're not going to create visualizations for you. And that, that annoyed a few people saying, what do you mean? I, I, can't I just put a ticket in and you do it for me? We said, no. And even, that can be quite hard to defend against a senior person. For example, I have, I've had MDs come to me and say that. And I, but we've got the confidence to go back to managing directors and say to him or her, look, you say to me that you're not technical, but give it an hour, watch that online video, give it an hour, and if you're still stuck, come back to us. And what ends up happening is they don't come back after an hour, they come back after a day going, hey, don't you want to see what I've just done? And it blows them away, the fact that they can then, they can pick the tool up and run with it without any, from a standing start. So, and that's all because of the self-service model. The second thing is make sure your onboarding process is nailed. Ours is terrible. It's a big mistake that we've made. It, from, to get the license in Tableau, it goes through three different teams, and it just takes ages. It can take months, actually, to get a license. So try and concentrate on making sure that your purchasing process and your user on board. So when somebody wants Tableau, they get it like that. That's what I would say. Do you manage the, um, the presentation of the content on Tableau server? Um, and if so, how do you do that? Um, I'm curious from an executive level, ease of use, access, all of that. Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, no, it's all down to users. They control all the permissioning. We integrate Tableau with an entitlement system so it can be properly permissioned and use groups through Active Directory and things like that. But it's up to users to control the permissions of their own content. You know, we, we just don't have the manpower to manage that. We, they have to basically sign up to the terms and conditions to, 
Um, and then finding content is a problem in Tableau. I think anyone who uses Tableau Server knows it's very difficult to find content. Oh, Jake's turned up. Oh, Jake. to, to find content that um, it can be a jumble and very difficult. You get duplication of data sources and content like that. And the tool's moving on with things like govern data sources and more functionality. We did think about creating a portal over the top of it. We haven't got around to doing that. I'd say that's an open issue. What are some of the key things you do to ensure data quality? Again, that's a problem because we, because we give users the ability, it's all, it's the user's data, you know. If a user comes to me and says, my data's junk, I'm pretty much going to shrug my shoulders and say, so what? Because um, it's their data, they have to go and clean it, you know, and they understand that at the start. My, it's not my team's job to chase after users' data and make sure it's clean. Thank you, Kim. If you would start again, what would you do differently? Um, I'd get our onboarding process nailed. And I've actually written a blog post about this, so check my blog about the top five mistakes. I'd get our onboarding process mailed, nailed, and I would implement a training program from the start because we expected people to be self-learners and they weren't. And it was about a year and a half before we put that training program in. And once we put it in, the quality of content on the server started to improve, so I would get that in at the start, those are the two main things. You answered part of the question with uh, saying that users have autonomy over their rights management, but can you talk a little bit about the overall life cycle for content creation and deployment to the server, where that happens? Ah, interesting, so we, we, we use sites for environments. So on our production cluster, we have three sites, dev, test, and prod. Um, <clears throat> you might think, well, why have you got dev content on a prod box. I can see you all disapprovingly shaking your heads at me. Um, the, re the reason for that is there are some teams who exist solely in the development site. The dev teams, all they do is work in the development site. There are some teams that exist solely in the UAT site. If Tableau is down, to them, they can't work. So to them, dev is production. To them, UAT is, is their production. So we apply the same rigor to those, to those environments as we would to a prod prod environment. Um, we provide those three environments and many teams will go through the full SDLC. They'll create content in dev, do some funky stuff, go into test, and then with a nice signed off change management release process, we'll release their dashboard gracefully into production. Other teams will just go bang, bang, bang out of production like that, in, in and out of prod. It's their decision. We just provide the environments should they want to do it. Derek. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Uh, what's your approach to sites and site admins? mentioned that. Site admins, um, all site admins, we don't have site admins, we just have my team as server admins and the sites is for environments the way we do it. Um, we, I've seen some shops have sites proliferate out so per business unit and before they know it they've got 200 sites and it's an administrative nightmare. We think we got that right with sites actually keeping it to a very small number. Thank you. So, so from a, a consumption perspective is there anything that identifies when a user is uh, pulling data or looking at a visualization from dev, UAT, production? Is there uh, any yes, distinction? The, the, there is a site field in the Postgres database that you can extract and identify that quite easily. Great talk, Paul. Thank you. Thank you um, just a quick question. Are you, your executive training one hour kind of personalized module, did you have any resistance from exec teams? for trying to get them to use Tableau. We have a few instances where we have people who, are, who only want that thing in Excel delivered on a Monday morning. Yeah, and that's a constant battle I think everybody on. faces in this room trying to change that culture, and especially when somebody's senior, it's quite difficult to do. What I've done in situations like that is help authors say they want it the old way, like a cross tab, and I'll say, okay, well, let's help you create a visual way at the same time in a different tab, and why don't you give two tabs to your audience? And, then we'll monitor and see which one gets used, and gradually you'll see them gravitating over to the visual one. Um, and then we can also apply a bit of gamification and competition. So if you take a, a team of management, some of those we've seen don't want to use Tableau, they don't want the change, they'll stick with what they're at. So all right, I'm not gonna talk to you guys, I'm gonna talk to these guys over here, or these girls over here, and, and they, they're the one, they will embrace it. The next time they all get together in their management meeting and these people who have embraced it stand up and go bish bosh bosh with their Tableau dashboards, 
It doesn't take long for the people who didn't embrace it to give me a phone call and say, because they know that their colleagues are getting a competitive advantage. So you have to do a bit of Jedi mind tricks, that's it. <laughs> When you talk about self-service, are they using live connections or extracts, and how do you manage the performance against your data warehouse if they are using live connections? Uh, both uh, live connections. We're very extract heavy. Um, we track extract performance and failures, and we'll... Do you see us using No. Users, users own all the data sources as well. So we'll track performance of extracts, and if we see something that's taking long or failing a lot, uh, we'll, we'll help them optimize it. There was another one. Uh, so related to the extract, actually, so do, you, do the users have row level entitlements on there? And if so, I know there's like a duplication of data based on the... Yeah, users, users do have their own entitlements. So do you, have, do you find issue with that, with like the data size on some of those? Uh, yes, if we have an extract refresh limit of two hours. We auto kill after two hours, and we're going to bring that down to one hour. Um, we, go in after, we go after people with a big stick if they're not doing incrementals and, or failing regularly and things like that. But again, very manual task at the moment. There's a lot we can do in automation for that. And just one other thing. Um, regards to the SDLC cycle, how long does that take for you guys to move something from kind of like the dev into like the prod environment? We don't move it. Users move it themselves. It can take as long as they want. So, te so tech doesn't get involved in no. terms of... Um, it's completely self-serve. Users... All we do is create a project for users, and then it's all down to them. OK. So for high-intensive usage dashboard, executive dashboard, do you do any pre-cache warm-up? If, say, you know, you, they want to demo some external clients or something? No, we don't do any pre-cache warming. And uh, I don't really agree with that. I think one, it can skew your admin stats for hits on content, and I think Someone like Craig Bloodworth in the first front row there would be a better person to talk to about that than me. So do each group manage their own data sources then? Yes. OK, so what happens if sales is using a different calculation field for revenue as a finance team? We, we've, got, we've got some data warehousing teams whose job it is to hoover up data sources and kind of make them authoritative. So we've got one team whose product, all they do on Tableau Server, they've got 200 data sources, and then they make them authoritative, and it's their responsibility to make the bank know, hey, if, you look at, if you're after this data, we've got a data source for you. As I detailed earlier, the tool Tableau Server is not, doesn't make that easy at the moment, unfortunately. The thing like gov govern data sources feature that's coming, that, that will help. Uh, but you're right, it's a problem, basically. Hi. You mentioned the executive end user training. Do you do anything for the non-executive end users? Yeah, that's the, that's the regular training syllabus, but we get execs turning up to that as well. So that's, that's for like the 10,000? That's for the 60,000 at UBS. Anybody okay. can, can join into that. Okay. okay. And some, sometimes we get five people on a session. Sometimes we get 105 people. Okay. Wow. Question, huh? Chapman. Hey, Paul. Uh, so what's on your wish list from a server point of view from Tableau that you'd like them to change to make easier for you? And we've got three minutes left. <laughs> it's not long. So we've got three, three problems uh, with, with Tableau that, that Tableau are aware of. Uh, the first one is Tableau Mobile. We can't use Tableau Mobile because we use BlackBerry Dynamics as our mobile platform. The Tableau mobile app does not work with BlackBerry Dynamics. That's due to a, a limitation with the API that is used, and Apple need to fix the API, but they won't. So Tableau are going to create, hopefully create a new version of the mobile app, Tableau mobile for BlackBerry Dynamics. We're not the only bank in this situation. Um, the second problem is non-persistent virtual environments. So UBS has been moving to what we call the A3 environment, which is a virtualized desktop environment. Um, that means you log on and you can hit any particular server at any one time in the virtualized cluster. Now, the licensing for Tableau Desktop has a big problem with that because that means if you log on, you could be on any server and you'd, just have to, you'd have to relicense every single time. So unfortunately, we have to run Tableau Desktop for A3 users through Citrix, which sucks. Um, so Tableau are working on the licensing model, um, the, the, uh, on a licensing server model that will eliminate that problem. Um, and the third one is just a, a fairly basic one. The KDB database is very widely used in financial services. There is no dedicated connector to KDB. You can get to it via ODBC, 
Um, but I've got thousands of users just waiting for a KDB connector. So those are, those are, the, those are my three main issues. But a point I would make is that we, I said we're plugged into Tableau very closely. We've been very consistent with Francois and people that these are our three um, issues for the last two years. It's not good of me if I went to Tableau and every time we talked to them said, hey, we want this, now we want this, or we want this, now we want this. We've, we've prioritized our list very clearly and been very consistent with them, and they've listened, to be fair. Kribble. Yeah, wait for the mic, even though I know you don't need one. I was just wondering who actually still uses Blackberries. <laughs> Sorry, I, I didn't hear that. But I'm sure. I it was said, very who funny. actually still uses Blackberries? Oh no, no, it's not Blackberries. It's called Blackberry bought the app. It's called oh. Blackberry Dynamics. It's actually on on your iPhone. So <laughs> do some research before you try and be a smart. <laughs> <laughs> How's it going? Um, so when you first started off and rolling this out, how did you, what partners did you use within your organization to really evangelize this and get this up and running so buy-in kind of accelerated and you got more and more users? So we, we had a, a good partnership with the Information Lab um, out of the UK. Uh, I think I've employed five or six principal consultants for information from the Information Lab. They really helped us build the service up. Carl Olchin, who's, present, who's presenting today about training, helped build our training course up. MOI in the front row played a lot of role in building some of our infrastructure. So we really had a close partnership with those guys. And that specifically within your organization, though? So like, oh, within, you within my like organization? A organization, you know, I'm sure you started very Well, small. you've got to get your infrastructure people on side for a start. So your server people and your network people, you've got to be best buddies with them. Um, and then it's a lot about business sponsorship and finding the right people in the business who can evangelize your tool. Because not everyone's a Tableau fan. You need, and some people be trying to take you out. Uh, you need people to go into bat for you as well. Hey, uh, Tyler Adams, Silicon Valley Bank. I uh, was wondering what solution do you have in place at the moment uh, with regards to mobile? Uh, you can access Tableau Server through a browser in BlackBerry Dynamics, which is clunky as hell. But even that gets a lot of use. So when we get the mobile app, the usage is just going to go through the roof. I, I think this may be the last question. Um, so it seems like uh, you're really focusing your attention on uh, developing a space where end users can, can publish. Um, is that a matter of not having the right resources to support the source, or do you think that there's an opportunity for the future for you guys to start to leverage and access and, uh, and manipulate that source data? I'm not sure I understand the question. I think is it, why are we doing self-serve, basically? Yes. Uh, do you see an opportunity for a center of excellence to um, capture the source data and really kind of manipulate that or house it? Uh, I think the ownership of data should remain with the users. They know it much better than my team would ever do. That's what we do. So th guys, I think we're out of time. Thanks for the questions. Please do feedback or they might let me do this again in next year. Thank you. Thank you.